Throughout the menstrual cycle, women's bodies experience many obvious changes, including bleeding, bloating, cramps, headaches, etc. But in addition to these visible changes, there's also more invisible changes that are happening as well, including mood swings and cravings and so much more. While these experiences are real and happen every single day, popular culture has moved beyond the clinical experiences of women, and it turns out that women are getting dismissed every single day for being on her period. And this is actually rooted in a folk reality. For my research project, I wanted to learn the truth about women's reproductive health and experiences. And what I found was incredibly upsetting. Within biomedical research, there has been an incredible asymmetry in the amount of attention that gets paid to male reproductive physiology and women's reproductive physiology. Did you know that within the last 10 years, across species research, over 50% of that research has focused exclusively on male reproductive physiology? And on top of all of that, only 10% focused exclusively on women's reproductive physiology. We need individualized attention on male and female reproductive systems, but right now, women's reproductive health has some catching up to do. Now, after diving into the research for months, I came to find pretty quickly that there is a lot to know about women's reproductive health, like a lot. And on top of that, there was no way that I could learn it all, but you gotta start somewhere, right? For my research project, I decided to look more closely at how women's reproductive hormones change across the month, and in addition to that, if there's actually any relationship to women's fluctuating hormones and the amount of physical activity that they do each month. Now, I could have chosen to study anything in women's reproductive health, but I chose this topic for a few different reasons. The main two being, A, I think hormones and physical activity are actually pretty interesting, but also B, that it turns out what we know about women's physical activity and hormones is way less than you might think. Now, before I get into my research, there's some things that you guys need to know. Otherwise, the rest of this video is not going to make any sense at all. These two things are how women's reproductive systems work and also the basic foundations of biological anthropology. Let's start with women's reproduction. On average, women experience a 28-day menstrual cycle, but it's different for every woman. Some women experience longer cycles and others experience shorter cycles. These average 28 days can then be divided into three main phases, the follicular phase, the luteal phase, and ovulation. It is important to note that menstruation actually occurs during the follicular phase. It's not a phase of its own. Each of these phases serves a different purpose with the ultimate goal of allowing a woman to become pregnant. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's the reproductive system. It's a system that works towards reproducing. I think you get the idea. Now, as much as I would like to tell you guys what happens in each one of these phases, I was only allowed 10 minutes to do this video project, so I can't do that. So for the purposes of this project, we're gonna be focusing on ovulation. Now, ovulation occurs during the middle of a woman's cycle, and this is actually the only time that a woman is able to become pregnant. Now, Keep this all in mind as we transition into that second big idea that I need you guys all to know before diving into my personal research. Now again, I don't have the time to get into as much detail as I would like, so I'm gonna tell you the basics. And the basics means understanding evolution. Evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. Now, in order for this to occur, organisms must reproduce. And with every new generation, there's actually new mutations which could cause either benefits to the organism or harm the organism. Are you guys starting to see the connection here, by the way? Evolution happens by reproduction. There's some connections there. Yeah, okay, keep going. Now, from these ideas, we can draw the term fitness, which is the quantitative representation of individual reproductive success. In other words, if you have two organisms, individual X and individual Y, let's say individual X has five offspring and individual Y has seven offspring. Who has higher fitness? It's actually going to be individual Y because they had more offspring than individual X. It has nothing to do with muscles, by the way. I don't know why people are like, oh, the bigger the muscles, the more the fitness. Maybe that's pop culture. I don't know. That's wrong. Let's keep going. Now, putting these ideas together, we have evolution occurring through the reproduction of organisms. Again, it's more complicated than that, but I had to 
keep it simple for this video. Now at this point in the video, I think it's incredibly important that I make this disclaimer. And this is likely the most important disclaimer you'll ever see in your life, so pay attention and you will be tested on this later. The naturalistic fallacy is a fallacy found in evolutionary biology and biological anthropology that basically states that what you see in nature is morally better, morally good, or how things should be. This is never ever true. We see infanticide happening in nature all the time. Does that make infanticide good? No. Does that mean infanticide is something that should happen? No. Never. Ever. I gotta calm myself down for a second. Now throughout the rest of this video I'm gonna be describing some things that researchers and scientists have observed in women's behavior, physical activity choices, hormones, etc. And just because these are things that we see or that scientists are observing that does not mean that it's how women should be. It does not mean women are better for maybe increasing their step count at a certain point in the cycle. All it is is an observation. Additionally, this work looks at men and women in a very binary, two-dimensional way. But I want to say that there's many genders, there's many ways to reproduce with modern technology, and this examination is one very, very small piece of a very big puzzle. So please note that this study is definitely not representative of everyone, as much as I wish it could be, and the naturalistic fallacy is something that we need to keep in mind as we consider more works in biological anthropology. And with that, we continue you onto the real meat of this video, my research. Now that you know about women's reproduction and evolution, I can tell you what I studied. Now for my research project, I actually looked at changes in women's physical activity across the menstrual cycle. And basically what I mean by this is I was looking to see if there is an increase or decrease in women's physical activity that actually gets correlated with the phase of the menstrual cycle. Now my hypothesis was as follows. If women are most fertile during ovulation and and physical activity allows people to get in closer proximity with mating opportunities, then physical activity should increase during ovulation. Now there's a basic formula embedded in this hypothesis, and I know I just threw a lot of information at you, so we're gonna break it down. And this formula is behavior plus physiology equals pregnancy. And just know, I made this formula up, but it seems to function pretty well, and I think it'll help you guys understand everything. Let's turn back to my hypothesis. If women are most fertile during ovulation, that's the physiology, and physical activity allows people to get in closer proximity with mating opportunities, that's the behavior, then physical activity should increase during ovulation, because we're looking at this from a fitness-motivated perspective, where more offspring is the ultimate and unconscious goal. Now, in order to answer this question, I turned to the academic literature. What does this mean? I read a lot. And after a thorough review, I found four studies that were aligned with the variables that I was interested in phase of the hormone cycle and women's physical activity. And in addition to actually examining these changes in physical activity across the menstrual cycle, I also evaluated those studies in regards to their methods to see if what the studies are actually telling us is reliable information. First, let's take a look at the methods from each of these studies. As you can see here, I synthesized the data from these four papers into one table. And at first glance, you can see how variable the methods are. For example, study number two had only seven participants, while study number four had 259 participants. Additionally, the means by which physical activity and hormone levels were tracked in each study varies considerably. For instance, studies one and two track hormones with a survey, while studies three and four track hormones with a blood test. The problem here is that not a single study has a quality number of participants, tracks hormones precisely, and tracks physical activity precisely all at once. In other words, each study may do one thing well, but not everything. So what did these studies find? Study number one observed an increase in women's physical activity during ovulation, which is exactly what I predicted. However, studies two and three did not find any statistically significant correlations between physical activity and hormone phase at all. And finally, study number four saw higher rates of physical activity during the late luteal phase. So what does this mean? It means we don't know. We don't know if women's physical activity increases or decreases at one point in the cycle. One possibility is that the methods are just so outdated that it's not actually representative of what's actually happening. But another possibility is there's no relationship there at all and no matter how good your methods are, we won't find anything. Both of these possibilities are valid, but until more research is done, we don't actually know what the truth is. Now I wanna say that this small study on physical activity is representative of so many other works and so many other projects that need to get done to help us learn more about women's reproductive success. By learning more about the hormonal 
and behavioral shifts in women's bodies, we actually empower women all around the world. We deserve to know how our bodies work. So what do I want you guys to take away from this? It's basically that the function of women's bodies should be studied rather than ignored. And in addition to that, we should be celebrating women's bodies rather than stigmatizing them. Thank you guys so much for watching all the way to the end of this research project. I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, I'm not really sure how to end this, so bye. Mm -hmm.